So um, in 1999, we, de we described uh, the origin of HIV-1 uh, coming from chimpanzees. And about a decade later, uh, we uh, found that Plasmodium falciparum, which is the cause of malignant malaria in humans, is of gorilla origins. And so in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you how we obtained uh, these results. So all started in the laboratory of tumor cell biology at the NCI, uh, also known as Bob Gallo's lab. I uh, grew up in rural Bavaria and went to medical school in Munich. And I did for my thesis work um, a study on bovine leukemia viruses. So I was interested in cancer-causing viruses. And Bob, of course, had just discovered the virus he has his elbow on, HPLV1. Came to Munich, uh, gave a talk, and I met him afterwards and asked him whether I could come to his lab as a postdoc, and he said yes. In 1982, I arrived at the lab and, and uh, was to work on HTLV-1, but very soon the focus of the laboratory changed uh, to find the cause of AIDS. And uh, this was a very exciting time, as, as you might imagine, and uh, the results of all this work was published in four back-to-back -back papers in science in, in 1984. When I got there, uh, there were other people working uh, on these uh, viral isolates, and my job was to molecularly characterize HIV-1. And I was given that job uh, together with a postdoc who had just arrived, George Shaw, who is now my husband. We've been working together from the day he walked into the lab, and we have been, we uh, continue to work uh, for the past 30 years. Bob was a great mentor, very generous mentor to us. Uh, and uh, he's shown here at our farewell party when after two or three years of postdoctoral work, we uh, went to be become faculty members uh, at Birmingham. And what is shown here is a huge cake. And you can't, perhaps can make it out, it's, it's the cake of a cell. Uh, there are the mitochondria and the rough ER, and there are retroviruses budding out. And I'm handing him the knife to cut off uh, a virus particle. We went to Birmingham, George and myself, and Birmingham was, was, was a great place to work and to start a career. Um, we had great support from uh, the administration and the university and our colleagues in the micro department, biochem department, Louis Chow uh, being here uh, as, as a foreign elect member uh, this year. It's great to have her here and Tom Broker, her husband. We worked there and together with our colleagues, we, uh, we uh, uh, generated the, the first Center for AIDS Research, and together with uh, our first fellow, Michael Sag, uh, we established the first research-based treatment center uh, in the country. Now, Birmingham is also a, a great place to raise a family. George and I have uh, two daughters. This is Katerina with the fish, and this is Christiana. Uh, they're both here. Uh, you won't recognize them because this is a little uh, dated. Uh, uh, Katerina is about to graduate from Columbia University, and Chris is going to be a junior in college. George and I um, grew up in, in, in the country, and uh, we've kept horses at our own farm for decades. And the best horses we found were around Birmingham, where they breed and raise Tennessee walkers. Back in the lab uh, in Birmingham, I became interested in studying primate lentiviruses. These are relatives of HIV-1 uh, that infect a whole variety of different primate species, uh, each of which happens to have their own version of what is called SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, but it's really a misnomer because most of these viruses are not harmful uh, to the hosts in contrast to HIV-1, which of course causes AIDS. And because each of these species have their own version of the virus, we know when a cross-species transmis transmission event occurs. And we started to work with Paul Sharp from the University of Edinburgh, an evolutionary biologist, back in 1992, uh, when we first described the origin of HIV-2, which happens to be the transmission of viruses from a uh, primate species called the Sudi Mangabe, uh, which is uh, in, in West Africa, to humans on multiple occasions, actually a total of nine occasions now, uh, realizing that the virus is infecting Sudi Mangabe and humans was basically the same group of virus. So we were able uh, to define the origin of HIV-2, the second human AIDS virus, but the origin of HIV-1 was still a mystery. And the reason it was a mystery is because in 1989, a colleague of mine, Martin Peters, had actually discovered 
uh, in chimpanzees, captive chimps, in Gabon, sanctuary chimps, a virus that was very closely related to HIV-1. So uh, people said, well, fine, um, HIV-1 must be of chimpanzee origin. But then subsequent studies of nearly 2,000 captive chimps all around the world did not uncover any other virus. Then six years later, another strain was discovered uh, in a zoo animal. Uh, and this strain, when it was molecularly characterized, was very, very divergent from the first two. So all this uh, didn't really make sense. And uh, the breakthrough came with some serendipity uh, when Larry Arthur cleaned his freezer. Larry Arthur is a, a friend and collaborator who has worked in HIV vaccine research for a long time. And he needed to clean his freezer for making room for other samples. And he found in his freezer the body parts of a chimpanzee by the name of Marilyn. She was uh, a chimp that had been wild caught in Africa. She had antibodies that reacted with HIV-1, but Larry was never able to isolate a virus from her. But he suspected, and rightfully so, that Marilyn may have brought the virus with her when she was captured in Africa and brought to the United States to actually serve in the CHIMP um, um, uh, space program. She died, unfortunately, giving uh, birth to stillborn twins. So when we analyzed uh, Larry's virus, it became clear that this virus was about as different from the two Gabonese strains and the main group of HIV-1 and then an outlier, the O group of HIV-1, as it was uh, uh, to, as the chimp viruses were to each other. And then there was this one really divergent strain uh, uh, that, that was really out there that didn't make sense. So it was clear just from this phylogenetic tree, which depicts the genetic diversity, that first of all, there were two groups of HIV-1 that meant uh, two different introduction uh, of what looked like a chimp virus into the human population. Uh, and second, there were two groups of very different chimp viruses. And initially, it didn't make any sense. But when we looked where these chimp viruses were from, it did make sense. The red viruses came from one subspecies of the common chimp. It's called the central chimp, which is in West Central Africa. The blue virus came from a different subspecies of the common chimp called uh, Schweinfurthiae uh, subspecies, or eastern chimps, which is here in the DRC and, and eastern countries. There are two other subspecies of the common chimp, the West uh, African virus and then the Nigerian Cameroonian chimp. Uh, they, we had not uh, uh, had any infections from them. But when we saw this and we saw the pattern and we saw that these viruses were closely related to each other and to HIV-1, we proposed uh, that it was the Trogoditis, Trogoditis subspecies of chimp that was the origin of HIV-1, and we published this. And people said, well, this is an interesting idea. It certainly fits the picture so far, but if you really want to uh, convince us uh, that chimpanzees are the origin of HIV-1, you have to show that these viruses actually infect wild chimps. And we had to say, yes, there was something uh, to that criticism, and so we thought about how could we screen wild chimps. Now, wild chimps obviously live in the forest of Africa, uh, in, in very remote areas. Um, you cannot go dart them like you would dart lions. That's not possible because if one is down, 10 others stand around it and will defend it and uh, kill you if you come close. So there was only one way to do this and that was by non-invasive means. And non-invasive means only one thing, collect fecal samples. And that we did and we tried um, to uh, establish methods that would allow us to diagnose the infection as well as molecularly characterize it. And two very uh, talented people, Brandon Keel and Ying Ying Li, and also a student, Mario Santiago, is not shown here, uh, developed these methods. And we were fortunate because we could uh, treat the fecal sample in such a way that we could get antibodies out and we could screen the fecal samples so simply looking for cross-reactive antibodies by Western blood, and that's shown here. But uh, more importantly, we were also able to extract viral RNA to first amplify by PCR, small little pieces, but eventually full-length genomes, uh, to do the phylogenetic analysis of the types I showed you to compare to HIV-1 and to other viruses, and to even construct infectious molecular clones to basically generate uh, replication-competent viruses in the test tube. We also learned a lot about the host by doing mitochondrial DNA analysis to verify that the sample really was from a chimp, uh, and to enumerate the sampled individuals for prevalence analyses. And so 
9,000 fecal samples later and 10 more years, you're going to go home and people say, how was the meeting? And you will say, oh, it was, it was really great. And we met this one lady. She made her career was ape shit. <laughs> That's me. So 9,000 fecal samples later, uh, we have a pretty good idea uh, which uh, wild populations are infected with SIV here in, in yellow. We know the, the virus actually is endemic in the two subspecies that we had originally identified in the central and in the eastern chimps. We never found infections in the Nigerian Cameroonian and the west uh, central chimp, and there's a reason for it. And the reason is chimpanzees acquired their infection by cross-species transmission like we humans did. They eat monkeys. Monkeys have SIV. Chimpanzees acquired their infection from their prey species. And we know that because we have uh, analyzed the chimp genome, and we know it's a recombinant of two SIV lineages that naturally infect prey species. And it happened in this area because that's the range where the prey species are, and it was when the two other subspecies had already uh, been physically uh, separated, and that's why these two subspecies are infected, and bonobos, the second species of, of chimpanzees, and the other two are not. That also means that SIV ZPZ, just like HIV-1, emerged relatively more recently. So putting all this together, here in black are all the chimp viruses that we got out of these fecal samples. And in, in color here are the numbers and types of cross-species transmissions that we were able to glean from this. So there are two major lineages, as I showed you before, in central chimps and in eastern chimps. Uh, only the one uh, from central chimps has actually been uh, transmitted uh, to humans four times and to gorillas one time. We know uh, the species origin of the main group of HIV-1, the pandemic form, clearly comes from a chimp in uh, one particular area of Cameroon. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. We also know that another group, uh, which has only been founded by 20 people in Cameroon, also is of chimp origin. Uh, gorillas acquired this infection from chimps who live in the same forests. Uh, and then there are, uh, uh, is a very rare group, group P, that actually is of gorilla origin. We could deduce that. Virus went from chimps to gorillas and from gorillas to humans. Origin of group O is not clear yet. It could either be chimp or gorilla because we have not yet found a very closely related uh, relative. Now, the subsequent spread uh, after these viruses were introduced into humans has been quite different. There's one pandemic, the others are very rare, including in gorillas. Uh, and even more surprisingly, this other lineage, which was, is quite endemic with a 15% prevalence in eastern chimps, has never been found in humans. What about uh, the pandemic then? Uh, when, where, how, and why did this happen? Well, we can calculate back, uh, and we know HIV-1 first emerged uh, around 1910 to 1930. So HIV-1 is 100 years old in humans. And it also means, since it was first recognized as a clinical entity in the, in the 1980s, that this virus spread unbeknownst to anyone in Africa for 50 to 70 years. Uh, the pandemic first started in Kinshasa, and you may say, how did the virus get to Kinshasa? Because this is the area in Cameroon where the chimpanzee reservoir is. This is the area where chimpanzees in the wild harbor the closest relatives to the M group? Well, the, the answer is rivers served as a major, uh, uh, a major route of, of travel and commerce at the time. Um, also, urban populations, which are shown here at that time, were expanding, and the largest city in the area was definitely Kinshasa, and it grew the most rapidly. And it is possible that human-to-human -human passage may have enhanced viral adaptation and subsequent dissemination. However, the origin of HIV-1 uh, uh, came after the origin of AIDS. AIDS is actually older because we found by studying chimpanzee in Gombe National Park, these are the iconic uh, chimpanzees that Jane Goodall made famous in the 1960s. These are the only chimps in the wild that are habituated uh, to the presence of human observers. They're observed every day. Uh, by uh, people from the Jane Goodall Institute, and they also have SIV ZPZ, and over the period of a decade, uh, we could follow those that were infected and compare them uh, to those that were uninfected, and we learned that SIV ZPZ can cause AIDS just like HIV-1. The mortality rate is increased. Uh, we have some infrastructure in Gomba to do necropsies. We could determine that CD4 counts are affected, uh, just as in HIV-1 infected people. Uh, and so this virus 
uh, causes AIDS just like HIV, or can cause AIDS, like AIDS just like HIV-1. And it was this finding that got us interested in something totally different, uh, malaria, and in particular, the origin of Plasmodium falciparum. Uh, because we uh, saw in the literature in the 19, uh, 2009 and, and 2010 when we discovered that AIDS was actually pathogenic, we saw reports of new plasmodium infections in, in the great apes. And we were a little bit worried that perhaps a co-infection may have contributed uh, to the pathogenicity we saw in Gombe. Turns out that the Gombe chimps don't have malaria, but we didn't know that at the time. So we were interested in, in these plasmodium infections in particular because people described that you could diagnose them by simply amplifying plasmodium sequencing, not sequences not just from blood, but also from fecal samples. But the, fir, the, the early uh, uh, reports, uh, there was a lot of confusion. It was unclear how many parasite species were out there in these apes, in, in which hosts, and what their relationship was to human falsipra. And the problems came from most of these early studies had a very limited sample size, uh, mostly captive chimps, and, and uh, that can influence results. And also they had PCR-induced artifacts because most of these apes, as we now know, are infected with multiple different plasmodium species that are genetically quite divergent. And when you use PCR and, and bulk amplify, the TAC polymerase makes recombinants in the test tubes that don't exist in vivo and hence uh, you get sequences out that don't make any sense. And the solutions, of course, was fecal samples from wild apes, of which we had plenty, uh, and also single genome amplification, which basically is a limiting dilution PCR where you amplify only single genomes and hence don't generate PCR artifacts. And so we screened for plasmodium infections just like we had screened before for SIV ZPZ. Just in this case, uh, we amplified viral sequences and we had no trouble finding it. Uh, chimps were endemically infected. It was prevalence of 30 to 50 percent in the wild. It, it was all over the place. The only species where we failed to, to identify plasmodium infections were eastern gorillas here and bonobos. Now, the, uh, there are five different plasmodium species that infect humans. By far the worst is falciparum. It kills about a million kids every year uh, in Africa. Uh, and at the time uh, the, before we started this, the phylogeny had two groups, uh, primate parasite group uh, two that included falciparum and a, a single isolate from a chimpanzee, and then a group one which had vivax and all the other uh, plasmodium species. And so um, to differentiate these two groups, uh, this was uh, uh, got the species, a subspecies de designation of Lavarania. And what people uh, assumed was that the origin of Plasmodium falciparum was somewhere in Africa and that the, the ancestors of, of humans and chimps had all uh, these infections and that actually uh, this uh, parasite had co-evolved uh, with uh, the human ancestors for at least seven million years, and that's absolutely wrong. Because when we looked at our sequences, what we found was not just two uh, species, we found a, a total of six Three here in red, uh, only identified in chimpanzees, one of which was uh, contained uh, the sequence of this one isolate uh, Plasmodium rakenaui, and three here in green in gorillas. And uh, the human uh, P. falciparum sequences fell right within the radiation of the gorilla parasites. So it's very similar to HIV-1, where you see the human uh, uh, virus within the radiation of the chimp viruses. Here it's the human parasite within the radiation of the gorilla parasites, all coalescing to a single ancestor, meaning there was a single cross-species transmission, in this case not 100 years ago, but anywhere between 10,000 and 300,000 years ago. So uh, to sum up, what I've shown you is, um, I've shown you that non-invasive studies of wild apes have really yielded some unprecedented new insight into the origins uh, and evolution of, of human AIDS and malaria. And I've shown you a large uh, ape reservoir out there, and, and, and given that we have this large reservoir and only a handful of transmissions, it's clear that the hurdles are significant to cross-species transmission, but of course they also are not insurmountable. And so understanding the key restrictions that prevents these uh, parasites and viruses to jump to species, uh, we hope will allow us in the future to better gauge and prepare for future zoonotic outbreaks, which I'm sure will occur. Thank you.